Hello everyone, welcome back to the class. In this video, I'm going to do an introduction to another reading for this week, which is The Fortune Cookie Chronicles by Jennifer A. Lee, the co-producer the co -producer of the, um, the Search for General Zuo. And uh, I think this is a very interesting complimentary reading to that movie. So after watching a documentary, you can also check out this best-selling book written by Jennifer A. Lee. I put this picture here, which is a, a, the image of uh, the standard fortune cookie we can see everywhere in the Chinese restaurant all over the United States. But one thing very interesting is that if you tell um, very closely, you can see here the strips of paper telling fortune is not written in Chinese, not in English, but in Russian. So I think this image is very interesting and kind of um, implied the internal, inter internalization and the globalization of this American invented Chinese snack. And uh, kind of also uh, resembles the idea we are going to talk about, about this book that um, Chinese food is not only Chinese, but can be uh, in any country and can be localized everywhere. So yeah, very interesting picture here. So this book, The Fortune Cookie Chronicle, is written by this girl, um, Jennifer A. Lee. And uh, the chapter one I assigned is titled American Bone Chinese. I think this title has two meanings. So first, American Bone Chinese can refer to the author, Jennifer, because she was born in New York in a Taiwanese immigrant family. So she herself is a American born Chinese. And also uh, over this whole book, she was trying to say, what about um, the like General Tso's chicken? What about those Americanized Chinese food? Are they also American born Chinese? I think this parallel is very, very interesting, especially considering the author's own identity. So basically in this chapter, after having the real Chinese food in Beijing. So uh, I think Jennifer did a fellowship in Beijing University. So she got the chance to actually try the real Chinese food. And after having that, she begins began to roll her eyes at the takeout Chinese food because they wasn't, um, they are not authentic. But later when she uh, actually went to the Beijing restaurant, people will say like, you are Chinese, you are, you look like Chinese, you speak Chinese fluently, but how do you say like you are American? Uh, after encountering that kind of situation, she said, I was not American to them. I was American born Chinese. Maybe the same thing was true of Chinese food back home. It's Chinese. It just happened to be born in America. Or maybe the truth was closer, closer to this. It's American. It just looked Chinese. So I think he, she has two ways to approach to these um, dishes like General Tso's chicken, those American Chinese food. It's Chinese. It has happened to be born in America or it's actually totally American. It just looks Chinese. The same situation goes for the dish and the people. So I think here we encountered a identity issue for both American born Chinese people and the Americanized Chinese food. If we think in that way, I think our perspective on the Americanized Chinese food will be a little bit different. Thinking about the people just like us living in this, con in this continent and struggling with the identity issue, that's the same thing goes for the Chinese food in America. One very interesting example she raised in this chapter is a P.F. Chang, that famous um, Chinese restaurant. And this is a picture of it. And you can see in front of that, this restaurant, it's a chain restaurant, so you can find it everywhere uh, all over the United States. So, but um, I think one staple signi uh, statue in front of the gate of this restaurant is those terracotta warriors or terracotta horses which you can find in the Emperor Qingshi's tomb. 
So I think she also quoted someone working in that restaurant saying, no Chinese will consider putting the terracotta horses as a good symbol for a restaurant because it's something you can only see in a barrier place. But to the owner of the restaurant and maybe to its target audience or target consumers, this, the terracotta horses, represents Chinese or the taste of Chinese. So that's a very interesting misunderstanding or misinterpretation of Chinese culture, I would say. And also this Chang is actually not a person's name. It's a twist of some person's name. They choose it because first, it, it is easy to pronounce, and second, it sounds like Chinese. So again, give you the flavor of Chinese when you enter in or when you see the uh, title of this restaurant. And also the chef in this restaurant speaking Spanish and even their executive chef is from Long Island. So not that actually related to Chinese food. Jennifer said it's an American restaurant with a Chinese menu. PF chance exists because uh, exists because Chinese food has ceased to be ethnic. I think this uh, statement is very interesting because Chinese food is so Americanized that American now Americans now take the Chinese food as their own part of culture, part of diet every day, and the Chinese food is no longer exotic, cease to be ethnic. That is why this kind of American restaurant with a Chinese menu can exist. So uh, what's the impression from American to this American Chinese food? Jennifer write a little bit in this chapter. So first he was, as she said, um, Chinese restaurant or eating at a Chinese restaurant became a weekly or a monthly ritual for many Americans. And also, nearly everyone has a go-to Chinese restaurant. And the Chinese restaurants to them are reliable, accessible eating establishment. And even you can find Chinese restaurant in Baghdad. They have English menu, not in Arabic, not in Chinese, but English menu, and catering to Americans, to American journalists or American visitors. And the American actually said the Chinese restaurant in Baghdad has a taste of home. What could be more American than beer and takeout Chinese? So you can see that idea of Chinese food is actually, in fact, became part of the American life. And also, I heard from some of the individual talk with uh, your classmates, Chinese food became a symbol for comfort food something predictable and familiar when uh, Americans or when people need an anchor in a explosion of uncertainty. Because Chinese food is always there and always tastes like that, like that always good, so it became a comfort food. That's very interesting. And also, um, I think Jennifer made this kind of um, uh, conclusion like Chinese food has united so many different people from different parts of the country. Or I will say we can expand this conclusion a little bit. Maybe Chinese Chinese food nowadays, it's maybe I will say through Americanized, through comfortable nice, has the ability to unite so many different people from different parts of the world. Then let's take a look at the meaning or the culture behind the food. So if we say Chinese food always has a meaning, what could be the meaning behind this American-born Chinese food? So first thing Jennifer mentioned is that the Chinese food begged to be mixed together. Sweet, sour, salty, and savory flavors layering upon one another. They tasted even better the next day when the leftovers were reheated. So that kind of, um, you have the, maybe the broccoli beef and uh, put it on top of your rice and uh, mix it, mix it uh, and uh, that will get the best taste of it. So maybe we can extend it from that 
and say it kind of represents a harmony the ancient philosophy of Chinese culture like things should be harmony harmony is the uh, best condition of anything in the world and also I will say it kind of um, symbolizes the inclusive of Chinese culture you can take in everything and mix them together and get the best flavor you want so that kind of idea of inclusion and also um, she said a driving force behind Chinese cooking is a desire to adapt and incorporate indigenous ingredients and utilize Chinese cooking techniques. Chinese cooking is not a set of dishes, it is a philosophy that serves local states and uh, ingredients. And just as what we saw in the documentary, uh, no matter the size of the town, but uh, wherever people live, there is a Chinese restaurant. There's always a Chinese restaurant open in the middle of night or open in the um in in in, in a place of nowhere. So I'll say this is this comment is from that documentary. Some people commented on Chinese people opening restaurants everywhere saying they are savvy they are savvy and uh, enterprised and uh, they are adaptive and I will say the philosophy we can, or the cultural meaning we can draw from that uh, particular perspective is that Chinese people or Chinese culture, inside the, the, I would say the core meaning of Chinese culture is the determination to survive. To survive under whichever political situation, whichever natural situation, just to survive and being a uh, tenacity and uh, adapt to every environment coming to me. And uh, that kind of um, strong uh, willing to survive, I will say is the thing that is missing in the documentary about China and is well represented and well demonstrated in uh, this book and in the documentary, The Search for General Zuo. So now we got uh, a more comprehensive understanding of what a Chinese culture can be. And one more thing I want to talk about is about good taste or bad taste. So is Americanized Chinese food Chinese food? And uh, is it good Chinese food or bad Chinese food? I saw a lot of debate on the forum and uh, even in daily life as well. So basically, Chinese people, when they go to Chinese restaurant, they don't order things like broccoli beef or General Tso's chicken because they are not actually Chinese food to them or good Chinese food to them. But I think we should, uh, we should kind of questioning this argument and saying why it is good or bad based on which standard we judge it good or bad. And... Um, I think we will discuss this question again in the discussion section. But I'm, I'm, I personally is very curious about this, about your opinion on this question. Is authenticity superior, and why? Why we praise authenticity? And uh, furthermore, is there any universal standard for good or bad food? Based on which standard and which? Uh, you, which standard we consider them as universal, we judge the food good or bad. And also, where does all this value of judgment come from? And are we the people holding the authority to judge? So if we are not, then who have the power to judge? Or well, actually nobody. So I think it kind of has different layers of the, uh, the, of the question of authenticity about taste, about judgment, and about universal standard. Next week, we will read some very interesting articles on taste, especially on the idea of the taste. The taste referring to your taste on a thing being good or bad, and also your taste on food. So how these two connected. So that's the uh, main topic for next week. So basically, after watching a documentary or and reading this chapter, I think this image from the documentary best portrayed how Chinese food is 
accepted and uh, survived and existed in the United States. That is one single uh, package of rice traveling around the road, traveling everywhere. If you pay attention, this scene actually appears a lot in the documentary. And the car is always going, and uh, but, but the package of rice stays the same. It's always there. It will always survive and always existed, being your anchor, being your comfort, being origin of comfort. And I found that that's very interesting is that the printed character here is actually saying business flourishes. So again, it's connected to the philosophy I just introduced, Chinese people being savvy, being enterprised, being strive to survive under whichever conditions. So yeah, that, that just magically pieced together. I want to end this lecture with this very interesting comment by the professor from a university uh, in the documentary. So he was talking about authentic American Chinese food. And he said, um, there's nothing wrong with that. Chinese American food is a style of cooking. It's a cuisine in itself. We create this value for authenticity, but I don't think there is such a thing as authenticity. The idea that there is some original Chinese cuisine just does not exist because Chinese cuisine has changed everywhere. I think this idea is very interesting and worth discussing. So authenticity is not one stable, static idea always there. And we should, maybe we should put them into the historical context and thinking about how the idea of authenticity changed over time and uh, transnational, transregional, transcultural. So yeah, um, I wish this uh, documentary kind of give you a new idea of what can be called authentic food and how we should understand American Chinese food. Okay, that's all for today. Don't forget to leave a comments below and uh, on what, what whichever topic interests you. And I will see you on Friday. Okay, bye bye.